So I just saw Madam Web. There was no screening for it in my area. There were no late night showings before the day, so I had to go see it on Valentine's Day. And I thought to myself, probably not gonna do a video for this one based off of what I've heard, since I do try to keep it mostly about film celebration on this channel. Having seen the film, I'm going to tell you that this is not a movie review of Madam Web. I am not about bashing filmmakers, artists, I know how hard it is to make a movie. I do not know how hard it is to make a movie under the studio system. I was able to make an indie film without a giant corporation breathing down my neck, which is not the privilege that S.J. Clarkson had when she directed Madam Web under Sony, which I can only imagine was monumentally difficult. This is not gonna be a video about Madam Web and telling you whether or not you should see Madam Web. There are plenty of people on this platform as well as a website dedicated to aggregating reviews and giving it a number that's gonna inform you of that and you can choose to listen to those voices if you want. The information is out there. What I am compelled to make a video about is something that I heard pretty much every writer, some directors, and most actors bashing last year, and that is movie studios. But before we go any further, I do want to give a special thank you to the sponsor for this video, BetterHelp. The past few years have been so life-changing for me, becoming a father, dealing with the Hollywood strikes, making my first movie. It has been such a privilege to have something like BetterHelp to turn to when I feel like I really need to talk. It's a new year and a great time to work on yourself. BetterHelp makes starting therapy easier and much less intimidating for a lot of people. BetterHelp lets you have therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even messaging, whatever's the most comfortable version of therapy for you. BetterHelp can match you to one of over 30,000 therapists in their network based based on your needs, preferences, and location, which gives you access to a wider range of expertise than may be available in your city. To get started, you fill out a questionnaire that will ask you questions about what challenges you're going through and what kind of therapist you'd like, and then BetterHelp can match you with a therapist to help you. You'll be matched with a therapist in most cases within 48 hours, and you can schedule therapy sessions at a time that's convenient for you. And if you feel like your therapist isn't a great fit, you can switch therapists with a click of a button in your settings at no additional cost. So join over 4 million people who've used BetterHelp to start living a healthier, happier life. You can click on the link in the description below. That's betterhelp.com slash Chris Stuckman. Clicking on that link helps support this channel, but it also gives you 10% off your first month at BetterHelp so you can connect with the therapist and see if it helps you. Once again, that link is betterhelp.com slash Chris Stuckman. Thank you so much to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. In the case of Madam Web, this movie was put out by Sony in association with Marvel. Probably not to the level of association that Tom Holland's three Spider-Man movies were. This video is inspired by essentially every live action film that Sony has had some involvement in since Spider-Man 3 in the Spider-Man verse. That being Spider-Man 3, The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2, Venom, Venom Let There Be Carnage, Morbius, and Madam Web. Since it got pushed back due to the strikes last year, none of us got to see what Sony did with Kraven the Hunter, but we will this year, so I can't really comment on whether or not Sony treated that property with respect. And of course I know that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man films don't necessarily relate to the Sony Spider-Man universe that they're trying to set up right now, nor do Andrew Garfield's movies, but this is not about that. This is about how Sony treats their characters and their properties, and more importantly, how they treat their filmmakers and what exactly is going on, because I have so many questions. When you look at the films I mentioned that Sony has made, there's of course division from people about whether or not all of them are bad or good, and some people like more than others. There's plenty of people who like the first Venom movie, but I think there are more people who are a little disappointed by it, and especially the Let There Be Carnage sequel. But plenty of people enjoy Spider-Man 3 well enough. I'm one of them. There's a lot of things in Spider-Man 3 that I have fun with, although it's clearly not as good as 1 or 2. And there are people who enjoy The Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 quite a bit. But I think that if you were to look at a consensus, the consensus is that the live-action, Sony-based Spider-Man universe movies have not exactly all been home runs. I haven't mentioned the animated Spider-Verse films, both of them being terrific. The way I view the two Spider-Verse movies is kind of the same way I view The Invisible Man and Split and Get Out and other films that Blumhouse has produced. Because Blumhouse has produced a lot of other movies as well. But those three really do seem like, damn, where'd those come from? <laughs> Some studios have really good instincts 
and they can pick filmmakers and stories across the board that for the most part are gonna be at least decent. I look at a studio like A24. Pretty much most of their movies, if you see a trailer for an A24 film, you can probably bet that it's not gonna be terrible, that it's at least gonna be decent and maybe even really good. And I don't feel that way with every single studio. It's like a flip of a coin. You could get one of their best efforts or you could get another one. And I do think it comes down to the filmmaker they're working with and whether or not they back off and give that filmmaker the freedom they need to tell a cohesive, coherent story. That doesn't mean that every writer is gonna be great. Two of the writers of Madam Web worked on another film in the Sony universe that has been heavily criticized called Morbius. But sometimes what I've learned and what I've experienced myself, not on my film, but on scripts that I've optioned to some studios and it went nowhere, is that when people have power over you as a creative, when they're paying your bills and they're paying you well, they can tell you to do anything and you have to do it, no matter what. It's like that scene in Vampire's Kiss where Nicolas Cage is threatening to fire his secretary and he says, You're the lowest on the totem pole here, Alva. The lowest. Do you realize that? That's right, Alva. It's a horrible, horrible job. I couldn't think of a more horrible job if I wanted to. And you have to do it. You have to, or I'll fire you. Do you understand? Sometimes that's exactly what it feels like when you're a creative dealing with a larger entity that has control over your creation or at least your script or your story or your characters. When they can tell you what to do and you got to do it, it doesn't matter if you think it's insane. You have to find a way to make it work. Now, I'm not saying that's what happened on Madam Web and Morbius and all these movies, but I would not be surprised because when I look at Sony's involvement with the Spider-Verse films, I see Lord and Miller that have had massive success on the big screen in the past that have made a lot of money for a lot of people and have proven themselves to be very smart at what they do. And I can totally see a company like Sony saying, why don't you guys give us your best shot and then we'll give you some notes. Now, for a filmmaker like S.J. Clarkson who made Madam Web, she's had a long and respectable career directing television, but she's directing her first movie and it's a Sony superhero movie. When I saw Madam Web earlier today, there wasn't a single part of me that thought, Wow, this is just a terrible filmmaker. I could not help but see the myriad of evidence that has been laid at all of our feet that this is a studio that is simply retaining the rights to their characters that does not care about the quality of this experience they're giving us. There's been too many examples of movies that all feel kind of the same, like a mishmashed early 2000s superhero movie. They can't seem to get out of that no matter how many times we've said to this studio, we would prefer it if you went a different way, even with the excellent examples of their two Spider-Verse films. And I can't help but think, who is this for? Who wins here? Is it the audience? It seems like it isn't, guys. Is it the creatives? Definitely not. Is it the studio? Are they making a lot of money because they keep doing this over and over again? Sometimes it makes sense to make a Venom movie. It makes sense to make a Spider-Man movie. Those are characters that are gonna generate money no matter what. Morbius and Madam Web, Craven the Hunter remains to be seen. That is not the same level of reward that a studio might receive from producing a Spider-Man or a Venom movie. So why are they making them? Is it to retain the rights? Is it to get some kind of financial break? Potentially. And in that case, they probably don't care that much about each and every one of us who forks over our hard-earned money to sit in a theater on Valentine's Day when they could have been doing anything else. I care so much about the filmmaker experience and I am so aware of how crushingly difficult it can be to make a film, but I also care a lot about the audience and I want people like myself who go to these movies to have a good time and to feel like they invested some of their money into something that gave something back to them, that inspired them in some way or, or made them just happy for a couple hours. And Sony and their treatment of these characters seems to be doing the exact opposite. Currently in the industry, it's the Wild West when it comes to spec scripts especially. From what I understand, a lot of spec scripts are not even being read 
Very rarely, in fact, unless you're a very specific kind of movie or a studio is looking for something so particular that you just so happen to be that perfect thing. From what I understand, lower budget horror is still being looked at, especially haunted house things or things that are very marketable. But in general, the industry has no idea what it's doing right now post strikes. They have no clue. Movies are selling for almost $20 million at festivals from first time filmmakers and other movies that seem like they should be selling really big because of the names that are attached aren't. Nobody knows exactly what's happening right now because everyone is so beholden to this algorithm or whatever Netflix is telling them people want to see. This is creating an almost robotic-like dystopian conveyor belt of movies that we are essentially supposed to kneel at the very end of, open our mouth really wide and just consume, and then ask when do we get the next conveyor belt thing that you have generated for us from your algorithm robotic AI thing, whatever that is. Because when I watched Madam Web, there wasn't a single part of me that thought a writer sat down and came up with the idea of the final fight happening underneath a giant neon Pepsi Cola sign. I just don't think a writer sat in their apartment in LA and thought, that's a good idea. I'm pretty sure Sony said, we have to incorporate Pepsi in some way and deal with it. And that's what it's like for a lot of these creatives. I just heard a story today about someone who's working with a massive entity studio, I won't say what it is, who has hired that person to write a story based off of a very interesting hook. He wrote the whole script, came back to them, and they said, you know what, we don't really like that hook anymore, but we still like your story. Can you make it work without the hook? And this poor writer is trying to figure out how in the world <laughs> they got hired to write a story based off of an idea and are now told to write the exact same story, but without the idea. And that's exactly the type of situation that so many writers find themselves in. And I would not be surprised if a lot of these Sony Spider-Man universe movies have had very similar conversations bouncing around their meetings. It's maddening and it does good for no one. So what are my solutions for this? It's the same solution I've said for a couple years now because I've started to make more discussion-based videos about the industry and how we can communicate with them and get better films and start to enjoy the theater going experience more and not just hope that a great film like Godzilla Minus One comes out of Japan so that we can enjoy that here. And it's the same thing I've always said, they hear us through our wallets. If a movie comes out that is genuinely great and we happen to see it in a theater, that's fantastic, but then buy it to own on digital or buy the Blu-ray of it. Let them know like this is more like it. And that's what we're getting with Oppenheimer. It's what we're getting with Barbie. When you see a movie where it's like, okay, that creator, Greta Gerwig, took an IP, Barbie, and made a completely original movie out of it and it became the highest grossing film of the year and it's nominated for multiple Oscars even though she sh totally should have been nominated for director. They hear that. They understand, all right, so IP-ish, but original, got it. And that's okay, like there's so many openings for filmmakers to take very original ideas into things. In an ideal perfect industry, the filmmaker studio relationship would be more of an understanding, loving relationship. But the problem right now is that so many studio executives, people who are making the decisions, did not come from a place of creativity. They were potentially managers or agents or people outside of the creative space in Hollywood who worked their way into a place where they're now telling creatives what to do. That's not the case for all of them, but it is the case for many of them. And they don't have ideas. They just have like inklings of what the market might want. What's selling big? What's not selling big? Well, we need to go towards this path because that movie sold really big. People are looking for this. Our Netflix algorithm is suggesting that we need to make a movie about kung fu pirates who also cook. Like, that's what's happening. And it sounds like a joke, but I I'm, I'm swear to you, it's not. It's not a joke. So people have been put in positions of power who want to be creative, but aren't creative. But they're put in a position where they now have to tell creatives what to do. And that's why you're seeing a lot of these things that you're seeing in film lately. And the hopes are that more filmmakers are able to break through with like an indie film. Look at Nolan. He was able to kind of prove himself. He took those steps. You know what I mean? In the case of a lot of these filmmakers who make their first movie as a giant studio film, the studio does not look at that filmmaker as if they are an equal. 
They look at them as if they're someone they can boss around and tell them what to do because they're paying the bills and what have you done exactly? And that's a lot of what we're seeing now. So pay for movies that are good, keep paying for movies that are good. That's the only way that we can turn the dial to where it needs to be. Guys, thank you so much as always for watching. I really do like making these discussion videos. I do think that as I learn more about the industry, I have a unique position to be able to discuss ways that we can make it better, ways that we can help it, and hopefully in the end, do what we all want, is to see good movies and have fun watching them and, and feel inspired. That's what we all want, right? We wanna see good movies. So thank you as always for watching, guys. Look forward to more videos very soon. I've got another feature presentation video coming out this Sunday. I'm very excited about it. It's definitely not a fun movie, but it is an excellent movie called Grave of the Fireflies. If you've never seen it, it's a really tough watch, but it's an absolutely monumental achievement that I have been wanting to talk about for many years. Guys, thank you so much. As always, look forward to more videos very soon. And if you like this, you can click right here and get stuckmanized.